A knock on the door this time of day? Who could it be? <gasps> Winslow, we got a package! <gasps> oh, let me see, let me see! Okay, just hold hold on, here. Let me see, Okay, let me okay, see. got it. I'm, I'm, just give me a second. This thing's uh, Oh my God. What? what? Winslow. What is it? I think this thing might be haunted. Haunted? Did someone say haunted? Hey, who the, who the hell are you? I'm Zach Baggins, ghost hunter extraordinaire. Oh, is this spooky? Here, let me see that. Don't touch my box, man. Get off me, man. Come on. Zach Baggins? What are you doing here? I'm here to see if there's any ghost in your house, along with any other haunted objects. Uh, hunter? I hate ghosts, please. Yeah, I'm... What about you, friend? Are you... You must be haunted. Look at yeah, you. No, you don't look like touch Winslow. Freak. He's not <gasps> haunted. Winslow... Don't touch me! I, Winslow, don't I... Don't fucking oh, touch yeah. me! Get your yeah, baby head off me! No, no, he's not no, haunted, no, I swear. No, oh, my God. Stop, stop it! Wait, I'm get out of here! I'm just gonna... You fucking asshole! I'm just gonna, oh, you leave know, me open this box upstairs. Stop oh, it! This, this oh, guy's God. definitely haunted. Help me! Yep, you're a haunted little guy, aren't you? Okay, I'll just, I'll let them deal with that down there. Welcome back to the Papa Meat channel. How you doing, how you doing? Come on in and sit on down because today we're talking about one of the most cursed objects of all time. If not the most cursed object probably ever recorded, I would say. Today we're talking about the infamous, the diabolical, the evil Dybbuk box. <laughs> If you're not sure what the Dybbuk box is, let me fill you in. The Dybbuk box is a wine cabinet that game fame due to claims that it is haunted by a Dybbuk, a malevolent spirit from Jewish folklore. Shalom. Okay. Today's video is sponsored by Factor. If you're like me, it's tough navigating through a busy schedule and starting to eat healthier, start little better habits. I don't have time to worry about portion sizes, calorie counting, and eating enough protein. I have too much on my goddamn plate. But luckily, Factor has me covered on all those fronts. Factor has delicious ready-to-eat meals that are chef-crafted and dietitian approved In just two minutes, you can heat, eat, and enjoy, baby! Whether you need calorie smart, keto, protein plus, or vegan, there are more meal options for you than ever! And for the people that just enjoy gourmet side of life, Factor now has the gourmet plus meals that include ingredients such as broccoli, brava butter, shrimp, and filet menu. <laughs> With over 35 options to choose from each week, you're sure to find something you like. Factor even has one-on-one -on -one nutrition coaching for those like me that are looking to be better every time they sit down to eat, baby. Come in, coach. I'm ready to play. The best part of Factor is that there's no prep work, no standing in grocery lines, and virtually no cleanup. Just scoop, plop, and throw away. Living la vida loca. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code BABAMEATFDI to get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off your next month of orders. That's code BABAMEAT50 at factor75.com to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month of orders. Thank you to Factor for sponsoring the video and back to the video. The term dibbuk comes from the Hebrew word cling. In Jewish mythology, a dibbuk is a restless, often evil spirit that possesses and clings to the body of a living person, typically seeking to complete unfinished business or exact revenge. According to legend, there are only 10 dibbuk boxes in the entire world. These boxes are believed to contain the concentrated evil of the 20th century, and it is said that opening one can unleash the dark forces into the world. AKA Pandora's box kind of mythology. They all kind of tie together world mythologies and religions and stuff. But that is, that is essentially what the Dybbuk box is. It's an evil box and the Dybbuk box that is known to be from the movie, The Possession or Zach Bagans, Baggins, wherever the hell his name is downstairs yelling at my computer. They made it really popular. It's become a huge haunted attraction. And from a lot of cases, there's been a lot of just weird cursed shit going on. A lot of documented stuff too. But I'm curious to see the origins of it. I mean, where did it even come from? Who was its first major your owner. Well, let me tell you. The story of the Dibbit Box as we know it began in 2001. Why can't I forget that year? When a man named Kevin Mann has purchased the box at an estate sale in Portland, Oregon. The box reportedly belonged to a 103 year old Holocaust survivor who had escaped Nazi occupied Poland. According to Kevin, the survivor's granddaughter warned him that the box contained a Dibbit and that opening it would bring terrible, 
terrible misfortune. So he bought it. He bought the box anyways. What a weird thing, dude. If I was at a garage sale and some guy's like, if you open that the box, is it here where the spooky stuff is there? I would, I, I, actually, you know what? I would probably like, give me that fucking box, old man. <laughs> and grab it from him. Fucking hit his hand. Car! Which also, why did she keep it that long? Maybe she is a protector. Protecting the world from the evil. Only I can stop this evil, this spookiness. Ignoring this ominous warning, Kevin purchased the box and immediately opened it when returning home, which I love that. Just some like blind old Jewish person being like, it is spooky. Don't open this if I. And he just goes home and he's like, which in Kevin Manis's defense, he thought it would be a good gift for his mother, which is kind of funny. Like I could see myself gifting my mother a cursed box, thinking it's funny being like, look at this. And she's like, oh my God, look at it. It's a nice box. I love it. And I'm like, it's haunted. You know, it has like a little bit of character to it, right? But inside the box, Manis noticed a couple of very odd and peculiar things, such as two locks of hair bound with string a dried rosebud, a strange black cast iron candlestick holder with octopus-like legs, a golden wine goblet, a granite slab with the Hebrew words Shalom inscribed on it, and two 1920s era pennies. I say that's the concoction of a mad, mad alchemist dabbling in satanic rituals. Do Jewish people have like satanic stuff? Yeah, they believe in the devil. Is there a hell? I thought Jewish people didn't even believe in heaven. Whoa. I thought I thought that was true. Like they don't they don't believe in like a heaven or it, it, so it, Judaism is the original, and then Christianity is the fan fiction that adds on. Okay, first off, Nick. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna believe you because this is coming from a guy who was raised in a cattle farm in Missouri. I don't know. I very I don't really have any Jewish friends. I wish I did. Clashing some ideologies. You're not Jewish, Nick. You're just Italian American, which is the worst. These objects that Kevin found in the box, seemingly random but potentially laden with symbolic meaning, added to the mystery that surrounded the box even. And on Halloween, Kevin gifted the box to his mother, which is a that's a fun Halloween gift, right? Nice vintage trunk or box or whatever, and then it's even haunted. And you're like, oh my god, what a spooky gift. Yeah, what a day. Whatever. Abra, Abra, Kodabra. You ever hear that song, Steve Miller Band? Oh, no. Oh, man, such a good one. And after Kevin's mom opened the box for the first time, she reportedly felt an evil presence and experienced a cold breeze emanating from the box, which, depending on where she was, you might have been a little spooked out by the story, so she might have, that might have just been mental. But also, immediately after that, she suffered a stroke. <laughs> Back to back, cold breeze, stroke. And this is a quote from Kevin, and he says this. I found my mom sitting in a chair beside the cabinet. Her face had no expression, but tears were streaming down her cheeks. And no matter how I tried to get her to respond, she, she, she would not, she could not. It turned out that my mother had suffered a stroke. She was taken to the hospital by an ambulance and she ended up suffering partial paralysis and losing her ability to speak any form to speak. Oh my God. And losing her ability to speak in form words. God, I must have had a stroke too, trying to read this. Don't put that in editor, f you. When I asked her the following day how she was doing, she teared up and spelled out the words, no gift. I assured her that I, I had given her a gift for her birthday, thinking she didn't remember because she's a dumb c just kidding. But she became more upset. <laughs> okay, yeah, don't put that. She became even more upset and spelled out the words hate gift. I laughed and told her not to worry. What a weird way to end that quote. No gift. No gift. That's spooky. Hate gift. Hate gift. Oh, you're so silly, mom. Yeah, mom, stop. You're silly. All right, I'm going to leave this curse box on your chest while you go to sleep, okay? <laughs> there you go. She's like, <laughs> <laughs> Despite her distress, Kevin still did not associate the stroke with the dipping box because he's an idiot and instead dismissed it as a tragic and very odd coincidence. He decided to keep the box in his furniture store, unaware that his decision would lead to a series of increasingly disturbing events. He gets a box from a distressed, borderline, senile Jewish man, puts his mother into a stroke, and then now puts his box into a public furniture store. Kevin, he's a bit of an odd duck, if I'm being honest, all right? And this is really where we see the paranormal activity begin. The ball has begun to roll. The little Dybbuk box that I'm going to name. What's a good Jewish name? I was going to say Matthew, but that's more like Christian. Christian. Deborah. Deborah? Isn't that the demon king from Dragon Ball Z? I'm going to say 
Uh, we're just going to say Dave. That's a good one. David is a biblical name from the Old Testament. There you go. David. Boom. David the Dybbuk Demon. David the Dybbuk Demon. I like that. Okay. Over the next two years, Kevin Manis and those around him experienced a range of terrifying phenomena, all seemingly linked to the Dybbuk box. The most immediate effect was the onset of intense reoccurring nightmares between him and his family members. Not only did Kevin have nightmares, but every member of his family as well, who probably worked at the goddamn furniture store, started having terrible nightmares. Like they're all bags on their eyes. Anyone else having horrible, horrible nightmares every night? It's like you, dude. Every time I come into work, you're always just like, I had the craziest nightmare last night. And the, Nick, it almost looks like he has like fucking two leathery fucking Dolce Gabbana bags under his eyes at all times. He's just like, so I didn't get very good sleep last night. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. Which in all these nightmares, Kevin described one of the dreams he had. And in this dream, he would walk with a trusted friend only for the friend to suddenly transform into a hideous demonic hag that would then beat him. Which does sound scary. Don't be wrong. We're starting to get the hag thing because I'm pretty sure the hag is also supposed to resemble the Dybbuk, which the Jewish people, you can figure out what you mean by hags and old women being demons. That's, that's up to you. But to me, it also read as like a sexual fantasy dream between him and his friend. A little bit. You're a straight guy. You're your friend transforms into a woman, beats you, probably because you, you're having sex with them and you think it's wrong. And he's beating you as, you know what I mean? You're like, I'm not gay, I'm so confused. What am I supposed to, what am I doing? I've had reverse dreams where it's girls that turn into my best friend who suck my dick. Upon waking, Manus often found bruises and scratches on his body, yet he continued to rationalize his experiences unrelated to the box. I love how Kevin just will not give into the box at all. He's like, well, I mean, it's just the rat infestation we have in the house. <laughs> no big deal. See, he like lifts up his covers. There's like six rats like gnawing on his foot. See, it's probably what that is, obviously. <laughs> Lows back to sleep. In addition to the nightmares, Kevin reported feeling overwhelming fatigue, nausea, and a general sense of unease whenever he was near the box. <laughs> Something about this box. This goddamn box. Why do I feel so tired all of a sudden? It's like there's like a, like a like face looking out of it, like <laughs> He's like, this thing is, there might be something going on with this box. Others who came in contact with the box also developed unexplained physical symptoms, such as headaches, coughing fits, and strains welts or rashes, which also just leads me to believe that Kevin's furniture store might have also just been like moldy. There's asbestos in the walls or whatever, black mold. But it's the damn divot box they look, look up on the ceiling. It's just like rotted. <laughs> But these symptoms were sudden, severe, and lacked any clear explanation, so the mold thing probably didn't happen. It was probably just the goddamn box. And as time went on, Kevin began to notice more overt paranormal activity in both his home and the furniture shop that he owned. Objects would move on their own, strange noises like footsteps and banging sounds became common, and doors would slam shut without any apparent cause. I wonder at what point did Kevin, he's just like, okay, this thing's haunted. <laughs> I like how he's like, after a while, I did start to notice some kind of weird stuff. All the doors in the place are opening and like some windows are opening and shutting closed things like flying around the room he's just like <laughs> okay um this might be paranormal <laughs> And light bulbs frequently burned out or shattered unexpectedly. I think that's because Kevin didn't pay the electricity bill. I think he was wired into the building next door so he didn't have to pay electricity and it caused a surge. I'm gonna put that on the docket of Kevin's sins. Kevin's brother and sister-in-law complained of a strong odor of cat urine, which seemed to emanate from the box and linger in the surrounding area. Which once again, how do we know that Kevin wasn't just putting cats inside the box? He's a sadistic killer and the cats are so afraid that they're pissing in the box. I would love to see too. He like opens it. He's just like, I don't smell anything. It smells perfectly normal to me. <laughs> it's like loves to smell of cat pee. Just like puts like wears it like a hat. His like face is totally covered. Oh my. <laughs> well, in the eBay listing, which we'll get into, he did say many times, I do not own a fing cat. Well sure he does. He might not own a cat, but do you think Jeffrey Dahmer's like, yeah, I own a cat after he skins it alive? And he's like, I wanna see its insides. I wanna know how its insides work. I don't think people are like, I'm a pet guy. I don't even own a cat. I'm getting out of here. He like stands up and his whole belt is made of like sewn together cat tails. And out of all of this stuff, right? Out of all of these responses to the horrible things happening in his life with family members having horrible dreams, cat piss that he definitely killed the cats from, I'm almost positive. Things just going awry. What does Kevin decide to do? He decides to pawn it off to his girlfriend. True love. Imagine dating someone. Imagine if you're dating this person right now, imagine your significant other being like, telling you all these horrible things about these boxes, right? And all of a sudden he's like, so I brought it to you. I want you to have it. <laughs> and be like, what do you mean? I'm not gonna 
fucking take it? Are you kidding me? Thank God she's smart. She's like, I'm not taking this. And she gave it back. So good for her. But after enduring two years of torment, <laughs> I don't understand. Why don't people throw this stuff kind of stuff away, you think? It won't let you. I can see that probably. It's like tempting you. I can't throw it away for some reason. I, I'm drawn to it. But Kevin endured this kind of trauma basically for two years until Kevin finally decided to get rid of the Dibbit box by listing it on eBay in 2003. <laughs> dude, eBay, wild, wild west back then, dude. Bid on it now or buy it for the seller's price? Which one? It's like shows the demon like crawling out of it. <laughs> Did you ever buy like Yu-Gi-Oh cards? Uh, no, I never trusted eBay. They were always, I bought like the Egyptian God cards before yeah, they, they were, were printed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know like back, especially like back eBay back then, I don't think that they had like the verified seller thing yet. So it was just, everything was just, sh it was really popular, but I remember everything just being dog sh but in the product description of the Dibbit box, Kevin goes into great detail about how cursed the object is. And at the end of it all, he wrote, help me <laughs> like just imagine there's a guy too like on his web browser like he's like glasses down and he's just like I don't see why I couldn't just take that off his hands. <laughs> the listing attracted the attention of a museum director named Jason Haxton, who did not initially believe in the supernatural, but bought it out of curiosity for $280, which there was a bidding war between him and someone else. So, and I think it, the price started at a hundred bucks and he's like, God damn it. He keeps like having to like up his bid. Especially like 2003 money, you'd be like, fuck man. Your son's like bitching at you to buy him like a PS2. And he's like, I got the goddamn divot box son. I'm sorry. I gotta help this guy. Yeah, I know you want to play tag in the power of Juju with the rest of your friends, but you'll have to wait. Unfortunately for Jason though, he quickly regretted his purchase, not because of his OB son wanting tag in the power of Juju. That was later down the road. This is for different reasons. From the moment Jason received the box, he was plagued by what he described as a tidal wave of bad luck. Jason experienced severe physical symptoms, including stabbing pain, hair loss, and full body welts and hives. God damn, Jason. He's like, son, you win. His son's poisoning him. We can get tacked in the power of Juju. His obese son's eating like a fudge sickle. He's like, glad you finally came around, Papa. <laughs> Jason also began having nightmares of a hag, similar to those described by Kevin, and reported seeing large, dark blurs in his peripheral vision. His health deteriorated rapidly as he began coughing up blood and experiencing bleeding from his eyes. My God, good God. I like to imagine too, he's like just as skeptical as uh, Kevin was. So he's just like, son, I got you, Jack, and power the juju, please. He's just like, but I want a devil may cry three, father. And you did not give me that. There's a couple quotes from Jason here that I think are pretty interesting. The day it arrived, I put my hand on it. It almost feels like the thing is collapsing into a liquid state. What does that even mean? What the tarnation is happening? I'm guessing it was heavy? I don't know. Weird. I guess. I don't know. It, to me, it makes it seem like a bubble bed or like a water bed. It'd be like a liquid state. You'd be like, whatever. I feel like a knife is coming into my gut. I'm... <laughs> I'm paralyzed in pain. When I go to bed, I have terrible dreams of a hag that seems to come with the box. <laughs> All I knew is I got this thing and I got very ill. I don't know what happened and I still don't know. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Mr. Inquisitive. <laughs> Jason's just like, I don't know what's happening and I'm not gonna look into it. I don't know what happened. I read the eBay post that said all this stuff would happen. Well, yeah, he's like, what the f do you expect it? He's like, I don't know what is going on. My son keeps getting bigger, but I don't buy him cosmic brownies no more. He's like, foolish father. I bully kids at school who bring me them. But desperate to rid himself of the box's influence, Jason sought the advice of a rabbi who instructed him to place the box in a gold lined wooden container to neutralize the spirit inside. I don't know why that would work. Let's just put up a little info thing of maybe why that would work. Well, there you go. Love. Don't you say Jews love And following the rabbi's advice, Jason's symptoms did start to subside over time. But the fear of the box's power still lingered in the back of Jason's head. I think he kind of knew. He's like, mm, I think I want to get rid of this. So he decided to bury it in a military grade safe in Missouri, where it remained for several years. And you're probably thinking, wow, that's the end of the story. I mean, this is where it's buried underground. The, the demon is even buried literally underground in, a, in Missouri. That's the end of the story, right? How I wish that was true. Oh, what about this? Is this haunted? Hey, stop touching our stuff! Hold on! He's touching our stuff! Yeah, it's fine, Winslow. <laughs> what about this? Is this haunted? I feel a dark energy coming off of this item. In many ways, yes. 
And no. Mmm. How much do you want for it? I'll buy it off you. Hey, please be careful with that. <laughs> Winslow, stop doing that. Uh, I'm scared. Because in 2016, Zach Baggins, a well-known paranormal investigator, reached out to Jason in an attempt to purchase the box off his possession as Zach felt it would fit perfectly with his collection of cursed objects, which he's not wrong. He has a whole museum of it in Las Vegas. I went to it. It was like two and a half hours long. I'd recommend it. It was fun. Jason was reluctant at first to part with it, but ultimately felt that Zach Baggins, with his extensive experience in dealing with the paranormal, was better equipped to handle it. So he agreed to sell it for an undisclosed amount of money. Which, let me tell you, I, I thought this part was funny, because like I said, I've been to the Zach Baggins Haunted Museum, and in every room you go into, a hidden TV turns on, I'm not even joking, a hidden TV turns on, and Zach talks to you, and almost the first thing he says every time is how much he bought the item for. And when we went to the Dybbuk box room, he did not say. <laughs> In every other room, it was like hundreds of thousands of dollars. I, if I was a betting man, I would say Zach probably bought this for, I mean, over a million. I mean, millions of dollars, probably. I was going to say two million. A two mil I think two million is a conservative amount. I feel like I think even more. Embarrassingly amount I would, of money. I would say it's an embarrassing amount of money for something that sold on eBay for $280 in 2003. I bet Kevin's kicking himself now, too. He's like, God damn it. The Dibbit Box was quickly added to the collection of haunted objects at Zach Baggins Haunted Museum in Las Vegas, where it was placed in a specially designed room to minimize its potential influence on guests. Whoa. The box immediately became one of the museum's most infamous and talked about exhibits. And shortly after the Dibbit Box arrived at Zach Baggins Haunted Museum, Baggins and his team began to experience strange occurrences. One of the most alarming incidents involved the sudden appearance of mysterious protruding holes in the walls surrounding the box. I don't even know what the hell that means. If there's <laughs> visuals or something to represent that, that would help. But that, if, if someone told me, out of everything so far, I've been like, oh my God, that's kind of creepy, right? And then Zach, of course, Zach is the guy to be like, black holes are forming in my fucking museum i hate for you to pay to take it to come see it i mean you got we gotta get people in there but we gotta get you to pay ga all right can you pay ga for me these holes seem to materialize without any clear cause leading some to speculate that they were results of an unseen force trying to escape from the box Dibbick David, David wants out. Dibbick David wants out. Dibbick David the demon wants out. Zach also reported that many visitors in the museum who came into close proximity with the Dibbick box experienced intense feeling of dread, anxiety, and nausea. And that couldn't have been from the prices of having to get in there and being in there. Cause let me tell you, the feeling of dread, anxiety, and nausea is what I felt in that goddamn heat box. There was no AC in the Haunted Museum. It's in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's a goddamn oven in there. And also they had to put in like a water fountain area because I'm pretty sure people, you're walking through in every room they're like people keep blacking out in here and it's just like a bunch of obese people falling over it's like probably because they're getting fucking dehydrated walk around this fucking long ass labyrinth they're boiling alive but it makes but great footage oh exactly and he records all of it i'm pretty sure the waiver you have it's just like hey we can use you in any of this nick got a bloody nose i i, I want to go back to see if you're in the video now because you're probably like oh. Some visitors claimed to see shadowy figures or hear disembodied voices near the box, while others felt an inexplicable coldness in the room, even when the surrounding areas were warm, you know, like Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> in 2016, Zag Baggins featured the Dibbit Box on his show, Deadly Possessions, which focuses on haunted objects and their history, stuff that he owns, basically from his museum. For this episode, Baggins invited Kevin Manis, the original owner of the Dibbit Box, to the museum for a reunion with the box. During the episode, Kevin, who had not seen the box for several years, exhibited strange behavior after opening it. He seemed to enter a trance-like state and began reciting cryptic, disturbing phrases in a voice that was not his own. It was a British guy's voice. <laughs> And he, it was phrases like, Shadow man, I wait here in the darkness in the night time till morning I'll torment you so. I wish it was that crazy. Wouldn't that be awesome? Even Zach's just like, come on, dude. And pull it together just a little bit. Jesus Christ. After this event, Zach sealed the Dibbick box in glass to prevent others from opening the demonic item. Kevin later claimed to have no memory of the event, further deepening the mystery surrounding the box. Don't remember it. Yeah, I don't seem to remember what happened, Zach. You think me and you can go to MGM and toss the dice around, eh? 
<laughs> Zach's just like, Jesus Christ, what is happening in my what, is, what the hell is going on here? Get this guy off my get, show. Get him out of here. Well, I will say the glass case he has around it's pretty sick. It's like all, I think there's like Hebrew all around it. It's a very nice presentation. I don't want to discredit that it's worth going to. I want to say if you're in Vegas, you're not wasting money going there. I just want to say that. It is long and hot though. And I felt so bad because at a group of 12 people, 10 of them were my friends. And there was like a guy who really was really afraid of like everything. And it was his wife. And we were just like laughing. Every room was so funny. Cause like, okay, like one of them's like this. It'll be like, you walk in and there's like, it's like a barn, like a themed barn. And it looks really cool. And you're like, what the is this? And they have like a glass case around like a cauldron. And then once again, the hidden TV turns on and Zach's like, this is Ed Gaines Black Cauldron. I bought this for $180,000. And like every time, Zach's delivery is so funny that every time we would just die laughing. I just know that guy, we were ruining his immersion. Well, the, he didn't, the guy didn't even want to go downstairs in the basement. There was like a supposedly in the haunted house that Zach has, it's like an old satanic family used to live there and do rituals in the basement. So they have the basement open you go into. And we were all like, hey, let's go. They had like strobing lights in there. It was nauseating. But the guy like ran a stairs. He's like, I'm not going, I'm not going down there. You could tell that motherfucker was spooked, dude. Which is funny because we paid extra to go down there. Oh yeah, I was like, I'm gonna go, absolutely. I'm gonna pay extra to go down in your weird satanic basement, hell yeah. Also, one more thing to note is at the very end, like the last 10 minutes, finally employee went up to us and told us. Oh yeah, at the very, very end, because we got to go to, he had a movie called Demon House and he recreated the basement of that. And that was like the ending of the tour. And we were all like, I mean, such a good time, laughing, having a great time. And this guy like walked up and he's like, you need to stop. You're ruining the other people's experience in this museum. And I felt kind of bad because I was like, oh, he's probably right. But at the same time, I was like, dude, f off. Like, come on. Then in 2018, Baggins hosted a four hour long live streamed event at his haunted museum, featuring the divot box as the centerpiece. During the event, Baggins and his crew reported feeling intense pressure in their chest, unexplained anxiety, and dizziness. After removing the glass surrounding the box, cameras captured what appeared to be a mist or vapor manifesting from the box. That's proof. That's proof. Ghost. Viewers of the live stream also claimed to see shadowy figures and orbs in the footage. Concerned for the safety of his crew, Baggins ended the live stream early. Later, he made a statement saying this. I wasn't attacked. I wasn't harmed. I just felt something. I felt the power of it. To me, it felt good. I believe that it doesn't affect me as bad as it affects others around it because it knows I'm its owner. Which is funny because the previous owners were tortured. No. <laughs> That's his response. And one of the most widely reported incidents revolving the Dybbuk box occurred later that same year in 2018 when Post Malone was invited to Zach Baggins Haunted Museum. Yeah. During the visit, Post Malone and Zach Baggins decided to interact with the Dibbit Box because Zach gets a, he gets a little bit of an ego when celebrities around. Same things happens with like Nick Cage. There's usually footage of him being a little goofy, being a little silly because he's, he's a bit of a paranormal thrill seeker, you see. Zach Baggins removed the protective glass covering and Post Malone, though hesitant, touched Baggins' shoulder while he was handling the box. You dumb son of a bitch. Oh, I want some help. I couldn't get that glass up off the ship. Don't put that in. I don't know the song. Following this encounter, Post Malone experienced a series of unfortunate events. First, his private jet had to make an emergency landing after two tires blew out on the runway. Then, a few days later, his mansion was broken into by armed robbers. And a week after that, his Rolls Royce was involved in a horrible car accident. Which all this is scary, but like to me at the same time, I'm just like, you rich son of a bitch. That's all that they, every time I'm like, oh, your Rolls Royce, um, did, it, did it get banged up? Just me, just envious of all that money. Like, maybe I want a fucking Rolls Royce in a private jet. Post. Hey, Posty, give me some money. These incidents fueled speculation that Post Malone had been cursed by the Dibbit Box, though neither he nor Baggins confirmed this definitively. Post Malone even remarked, God hates me, in a response to a string of bad luck, which maybe it wasn't God. Maybe the Dibbit Box demon hates you, Post Malone. Which, if that's, you know what? Allow that person to hate you. I don't like Dibbit Box, David. I <laughs> don't. I think he's a dick. Well, what's funny is that they say this, but in the museum, Zach was like, Post Malone was cursed. Well, yeah, that's, that's the funny part, too, is just like, when we were there, that motherfucker was blasting that story over the TV in the Dybbuk box waiting area. In the waiting room, you have to sit to wait to go in and it's just like, Post Malone was cursed and died several times. We're like, oh, he didn't die. He died. Zach Baggins has continued to regard the Dybbuk box as one of the most dangerous objects in his collection, probably in the world. And he goes on record stating that it's the most haunted object probably fucking ever. And it's scary, right? That's where it still resides to this day. But there's a couple things I didn't mention yet. A couple pieces of truths that came out after the fact, after all this stuff, right? Which leads to a new question. Is it actually the most haunted object, really? 
Is it? Well, in 2021, Kevin Manis, remember him, the original guy who posted up on eBay, the, the guy back in 2001, came out stating that he made the whole thing up. Uh, yeah, I made it up. I'm sorry. You know, at least he waited like 20 years. Like, imagine he like messages the guy right as soon as he bought it. Dude, this thing's not hard at all. F you. Jason's like, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh. Kevin Manis is a creative writer and he wanted to create an interactive horror story in real time. He wanted to have an actual living horror story that someone got to experience. He confessed that the carvings on the box and the items inside were of his own making and that he had crafted the narrative to post on eBay as a creative project. There was a time when I didn't do anything creative. I pushed papers and I made a lot of money pushing papers and I absolutely hated it. And then one day my head split open, I unzipped it and I was an artist. And from that point on, I made my living artistically. I want to make that really clear. I would not give my mom a demonic box. Here you go. Um, <laughs> yeah. Which is actually so ahead of its time. This is stuff before even like creepypastas. There was like Ted the Caver of like people using internet based stuff to have interactive horror stories of people stumbling upon it and believing it's real. It's actually kind of sick. Kevin even said this about his box. The carving in the back of it is my carving. The stone was in the box is something that is a signature creation of mine also. Make no mistake, I conceived of the divot box. The name, the term, the idea, and wrote this creative story around it to post on eBay. Kevin also revealed that he conceived the idea of the divot box during Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, while praying and asking forgiveness for his sins. But ironically, after revealing the hoax, Manus experienced a series of personal misfortunes, including his car breaking down, his girlfriend leaving him, and the deaths of his mother and two friends within a week. Now that feels, see the, the weird coincidence that he was talking about before when he was making up the story? This feels like the tragic coincidence now that is or maybe it's Dibbic Demon David coming for his revenge. How dare you say that I'm not real? David, stop! Not Dibbic Box David! These events led some to question whether the Dibbic Box might still hold some residual power, even if its origins were fictional. John Michael says, what do you say people who continue to believe in Dibbic Boxes even after you've revealed that you were the origin of Dibbic Boxes? I don't know. What do you say to people who believe in Santa after they're 10? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's he said the story is fake, but what if it's actually haunted? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he made the whole thing up, but what if it actually is, though? It's a big coincidence. It could be just a major coincidence, guys. It's just like, you know, he made up the story, but coincidentally, it was already a haunted thing. <laughs> <laughs> Skeptics have long pointed out that there is no precedence in Jewish folklore for a Dybbuk to inhabit an inanimate object. Dybbuks typically in folklore tradition have only ever possessed a human being or something like living. There would be no reason for that to be inside of this box, like to, to possess that box. Traditionally, a Dybbuk enters a living person's body and cleaves their soul, causing mental illness and speaking through the host's mouth as a separate personality. Maybe that's what happened to Kevin's mom. Oh, shit. Despite the revelation that Dybbuk Box was a hoax, Zach Baggins remains convinced to this day that the box holds some dark power because he spent $2 million on it. And he's like, I have a whole fucking room I've dumped money into. We got to keep this bitch rolling. You know what I mean? Baggins has also argued that regardless of its origins, the Dybbuk Box has demonstrated a capacity to affect those who come in contact with it, citing not only his own experiences, but also the visitors of his museum. Yeah, I mean, people get pretty scared when they go in there. So I'm mean, it's probably, I mean, it's fair. It's safe to say that it's probably still haunted. <laughs> Visitors are warned of the potential risks associated with viewing or interacting with the box, and it remains one of the museum's most sought after attractions. So of course, Zach is gonna go out and say like, oh, okay, and toss it. Like, why the fuck would he do that? He's gonna let that bitch ride. Also, you have to be under the assumption too that he's like, not everybody will know that it's fake. You know, who knows of that story? And in interviews, Baggins has spoken about his beliefs that the Dybbuk box, like many other haunted objects, carries an energy or force that transcends its physical origins. He suggests that the stories, beliefs, and fear surrounding the box have imbued it with a malevolent energy that can manifest in real, tangible ways, affecting those who are sensitive to its presence. I think there is so much more to the Dybbuk box, and regardless of its origins, it is very much cursed and evil. Like I was just like, yeah, it's fake, but people are so spooked around it that it has caused it to actually be haunted. That will actually be $55 for the GA if you want to come in, and we do have a gift shop on the way out. They give you a free shirt. They do give you a free shirt. Well, I mean, the ticket's like 70 bucks. We did the special. And we did the special. I mean, so it was like 70, 70 bucks for an $8 shirt. Deal. Deal alert. <laughs> but, you know, it's still kind of up in the air. Also, or I want to say this too. Remember that live stream I said from 2018 when Zach was doing this thing and they had to cut it early for the film's crew safety? He brought in a rabbi, which I don't think the rabbi knew what live streaming really was. So I think he thought it was going to be edited. So Zach is like talking to him, but the rabbi, I don't think, really knows that they're live. <laughs> Zach's like, so what do you think about this demon in the Dybbuk box? You think it's like scary or, and the guy's like, I mean, whatever fits your narrative. And Zach's like, ah, bah, what? We should get him out. And they kick the 
fucking rabbi out. And then after that, he's like, oh, I think we gotta, we gotta end this thing. It's getting crazy in here. The video footage of that is so funny. So uh, that may not be good with your script, but not, that's my personal mm -hmm. belief. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, um, let's go over here. So we don't, I mean, who knows, right? At the end of the day, who really knows? I mean, me personally, if the original guy came out and he's like, I've made everything up, why would he have to lie? It sounds like he's actually mad that Jason made more money off of him. I bet, I, bet, I, bet, I think Kevin would be. What's fucked up too is like, I would be mad if I was Zach, cause I'm like, you made me look like a fucking idiot. Like I invited you out to be on my cursed object show. And now you're coming out five, six years later being like, it's fake. Speaking of that, the thing he was reciting is a poem that he made. So he was just reading a poem. I so he's just, <laughs> Kevin was just reading a poem. Oh my God. He was just reading a poem they wrote because he's a creative writer. I don't know. It, it, it's a very compelling thing because one, it feels like a Ted the Caver thing where it's like a guy knows that his family's reading a blog. So then he just starts writing this thing to f with them. But then it turns out to be this crazy, awesome horror story. And this feels like the same thing, regardless if it's real or not, it still holds all this tangible, horrific, kind of like fun, scary aura around it that makes it so special and still like a fun box. Like even now knowing it's fake, I still go back just to see it, to know that this thing has had this much much infamy you know you've had the possession zach bag and show covering it it's it's been covered all to high hell it's just a fun piece of like horror history at this point so regardless if it's real or not in my heart it will always be the most cursed object it'll always almost have that title if, any, if anything because it's fake now it holds that infamy even more it's just the cursed object that never was and i think that's pretty sweet yeah i gotta say too after hearing that this thing's probably made up and everything i mean i have no reason to even believe that Winslow should be afraid of this. I should probably go tell him that it's just a hoax, right? Yeah, let's just, we, we can just go tell him. Here, just, just talking to my device. Here, just talk to, talk, talk to, <gasps> guys, you're I the worst time, this is I'm not sure he's gonna open it up. I think it's a hoax. Oh my god! Winslow, I guess that box was haunted. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's probably haunted, huh?